Hello, everyone. I've just been lazy. I guess there's nothing more to say about my absence in this channel. It's been almost a year that I've read for this channel, really. Um, the poems that were, you know, um, being uploaded seven months ago were scheduled. I had read all of those almost a year ago. So anyways, I'm not going to be lazy anymore. With another lockdown, starts restarts <laughs> reading the lockdown away. And yeah, I'm not going to be lazy anymore. I'm just going to go straight into the story. Um, but before that, I want to ask, did my voice change? It's been a while and I'm guessing my voice changed. Let me know if it changed for the better or for the worse, anything. Anyways, um, let's start uh, where we had left off uh, in the chapter, uh, starting the chapter, the Jeroboam story. Hand in hand, ship and breeze blew on, but the breeze came faster than the ship, and soon the Picard began to rock. By and by, through the glass, the stranger's boats and manned mastheads proved her a whale ship. But as she was so far to windward and shooting by, apparently making a passage to some other ground, the Picquod could not hope to reach her. So the signal was set to see what response would be made. Here, be it said, that, like the vessels of military marines, the ships of the American whale fleet have each a private signal, all of which signals being collected in a book with the names of the respective vessels attached. Every captain is provided with it. Thereby, the whale commanders are enabled to recognize each other upon the ocean, even at considerable distances, and with no small fallacy. Falsity. I'm sorry. I'm a little rough. Bear with me. The Picard signal was at last responded to by the stranger setting her own, which proved the ship to be the Jeroboam of Nanticket. Squaring her yards, she bore down ranged a beam under the Picard's lee and lowered a boat. It soon drew nigh. But as the side ladder was being rigged by Starbucks' order to accommodate the visiting captain, the stranger in question waved his hand from his boat's stern in token of that proceeding being entire, entirely uncertain, unnecessary. Jesus. It turned out that the Jeroboam had Jeroboam? Jeroboam? It turned out that the Jeroboam had a m malignant epidemic on board, and that Mayhew, her captain, was fearful of infecting the Picard's company. What a nice guy. For, though himself and boat's crew rema remained untainted, and though his ship was half a rifle shot off, and an incorruptible sea and air rolling and flowing between, Yet, conscientiously adhering to the timid quarantine of the land, he peremptorily refused to come into direct contact with the Picard. But this did by no means prevent all communications, preserving an interval of some few yards between itself and the ship, and Jeroboam's boat by the occasional use of its oars contrived to keep parallel to the Picard as she heavily forged through the sea. For by this time it blew very fresh, with her main topsail aback, though indeed at times by the sudden onset of a large rolling wave the boat would be pushed some way ahead, but would be soon skillfully brought to her proper bearings again. Subject to this, and other the like interruptions now and then, a conversation was sustained between the two parties, but at intervals not without still another interruption of a very different sort. 
pulling an oar in the Jeroboam's boat was a man of a singular appearance. Even in that wild, wailing life where individual notabilities make up all totalities, he was a small, short, youngish man, sprinkled all over his face with freckles, and wearing redundant yellow hair. A long-skirted, cabalistically cut coat of a faded walnut-tinged enveloped him. Enveloped him, right. The overlapping sleeves of which were rolled up on his wrists. A deep, settled, fanatic derelium was in his eyes. So soon as this figure had been first described, described, Stubb had exclaimed, That's he, that's he! The long-togged Scaramouche, the town hose company told us of. Stubb here alluded to a strange story of the Jeroboam, and a certain and a certain man among her crew, some time previous when the Picode spoke the town ho. According to this account, and what was subsequently learned, it seemed that the Scaramouche in question had gained a wonderful ascendancy over almost everybody in the Jeroboam. His story was this. He had been originally nurtured among the crazy society of Neskiuna, Neskiuna Shakers, where he had been a great prophet in their cracked, secret meetings, having several times descended from heaven by the way of a trap door, announcing the speedy opening of the seventh vial, which he carried in his vest pocket, but which instead of containing gunpowder, was supposed to be charged with laudanum. I have no idea what that is. Oh, they're, they're going to explain. A strange apostolic whim having seized him, he had left Neskiona for Nanticket, where, with that cunning peculiar to craziness, he assumed a steady, common-sense exterior and offered himself as a green-hand candidate for the Jeroboam's whaling voyage. Apparently, they're not going to explain what it is. Laudanum. Okay. They engaged him. But straight away, upon the ship's getting out of sight of land, his insanity broke out in a freshet. He announced himself as the Archangel Gabriel and commanded the captain to jump overboard. He published his manifesto whereby he set himself forth as the deliverer of the Isles of the Sea and Vicar General of all Oceanica. The unflinching earnestness with which he declared these things, the dark, daring play of his sleepless, excited imagination, and all the preternatural terrors of real delirium, united to invest this Gabriel in the minds of the majority of the ignorant crew with an atmosphere of sacredness. Moreover, they were afraid of him. As such a man, however, was not of much practical use in the ship, especially as he refused to work except when he pleased, the incredulous captain would fain have been rid of him. But a prize that that individual's intention was to land him in the first convenient port. The archangel forthwith opened all his seals and vials, devoting the ship and all hands to unconditional perdition, in case this intention was carried out. So strongly did he work upon his disciples among the crew, that at last in a body they went to the captain and told him if Gabriel was sent from the ship, not a man of them would remain. He was therefore forced to relinquish his plan, nor would they permit Gabriel to be any way maltreated, say or do what he would, so that it came to pass that Gabriel had the complete freedom of the ship. The consequence of all this was that the archangel cared little or nothing for the captain and mates, and since the epidemic had broken out, he carried a higher hand than ever, 
declaring that the plague, as he called it, was at his sole command. Nor should it be stayed, but according to his good pleasure. The sailors, mostly poor devils, cringed and some of them fawned before him. In obedience to his instructions, sometimes rendering him personal homage, as to a god. Such things may seem incredible, but, however wondrous, they are true. Nor is the history of fanatics half so striking in respect to the measureless self-deception of the fanatic himself, as his measureless power of deceiving and bedeviling so many others. But it is time to return to the Picod. I fear not thy epidemic, man, said Ahab, from the bulwarks to Captain Mayhew, who stood in the boat's stern. Come on board. I, I forgot what sort of a voice I did for Ahab. For anyone, actually. I'm sorry, damn. But now Gabriel started to his feet. Think, think of the fevers, yellow and bilious. Beware of the horrible plague. Gabriel, Gabriel, cried Captain Mayhew. Thou must either. But that instant, a headlong wave shot the boat far ahead, and its seethings drowned all speech. Hast thou seen the white whale? demanded Ahab, when the boat drifted back. Think. Think of thy whaleboat, stoven and sunk. Beware of the horrible tale. I tell thee again, Gabriel, that... But again the boat tore ahead, as if dragged by fiends. Nothing was said for some moments, while a succession of riotous waves rolled by, which, by one of those occasional caprices of the seas, were tumbling not heaving it. Meantime, the hoisted sperm whale's head jogged about very violently, and Gabriel was seen eyeing it with rather more apprehensiveness than, this, than his archangel nature seemed to warrant. When this interlude was over, Captain Mayhew began a dark story concerning Moby Dick. Not, however, without frequent interruptions from Gabriel. Whenever his name was mentioned and the crazy sea that seemed leagued with him. It seemed that the Jeroboam had not long left home when upon speaking a whale ship her people were reliably apprised of the existence of Moby Dick and the havoc he had made. Greedily sucking in the intelligence, Gabriel, Gabriel solemnly warned the captain against attacking the white whale, in case the monster should be seen. In his gibbering in insanity, pronouncing the white whale to be no less a being than the Shaker God incarnated, the Shakers receiving the Bible. But when, some year or two afterwards, Moby Dick was fairly sighted from the mastheads, Macy, the chief mate, burned with Arger to encounter him. And the captain himself, being not unwilling to let him have the opportunity, despite all the archangel's denunciations and forewarnings, Macy succeeded in persuading five men to man his boat. With them he pushed off, and after much weary pulling and many perilous, unsuccessful onsets, he at last succeeded in getting one iron fast. Meantime, Gabriel, ascending to the main royal masthead, was tossing one arm in frantic gestures and hurling forth prophecies of speedy doom to the sacrilegious assailants of his divinity. Now, while Macy, the mate, was standing up in his boat's bow, and with all the reckless energy of his tribe was venting his wild exclamations upon the whale, and essaying 
sorry, essaying to get a fair chance for his poised lance. Lo, a broad white shadow rose from the sea. But it's quick, by its quick, fanning motion temporarily, taking the breath out of the bodies of the oarsmen. Next instant, the luckless mate, so full of furious life, was smitten bodily into the air, and making a long arc in his descent, fell into the sea at the distance of about fifty yards. Not a chip of the boat was harmed, not a hair of any oarsman's head, but the mate forever sank. It is well to parenthesize here that, for the fatal accidents in the sperm whale fishery, this kind is perhaps almost as frequent as any. Sometimes nothing is injured, but the man who is thus annihilated, oftener the boat's bow is knocked off. Or the thigh board, in which the headsman stands, is torn from its place and accompanies the body. But strangest of all is the circumstance that in more instances than one, when the body has been recovered, not a single mark of violence is discernible, the man being stark dead. The whole calamity with the falling from Macy was plainly described from the ship, raising a piercing shriek. The vile, the vile! Gabriel called off the terror-stricken crew from the further hunting of the whale. This terrible event clothed the archangel with added influence, because his credulous dis disciples believed that he had specifically for foreannounced it, instead of only making a general prophecy, which anyone might have done, and so have changed to hit one of many marks, so have chanced to hit one of many marks in the wide margin allowed. He became a nam name... Ugh. I'm so sorry, I'm so rough around the edges uh, after so long. I haven't read aloud in ages, yeah. Edges, ages, anyways, ah, oh, goddamn. He became a nameless terror to the ship. Mayhew, having concluded his narration, Ahab put such questions to him that the stranger captain could not forbear inquiring whether he intended to hunt the white whale if opportunity should offer. To which Ahab answered, Aye. Straight away then, Gabriel once more started to his feet, gla glaring upon the old man, and vehemently exclaimed with downward pointed finger, Think! Think of the blasphemer! Dead! And down there! Beware of the blasphemer's end! Ahab stolidly turned aside and said to Mayhew, Captain, I have just be... Captain! I had just bethought me of my letter bag. There is a letter for one of thy officers. If I mistake not, Starbuck, look over the bag. Every whale ship takes out a goodly number of letters for various ships, whose delivery to the persons to whom they may be addressed depends upon the mere chance of encountering them in the four oceans. The four oceans? I need to search this up. Maybe back then it was just four oceans. Huh. Right, Pacific, Atlantic, I'm so sorry. Indian, um, Arctic, Antarctic, right? Is there any more? There are five oceans, right? Thus, most letters never reach their mark, and many are only received after attaining an age of three years or more. Soon, Starbuck returned with a letter in his hand. It was sorely tumbled, damp, and covered in a dull, spotted green mold, in consequence of being kept in a dark locker of the cabin. 
of such a letter, Death himself might well have been the postboy. Canst not read it? cried Ahab. Give it me, man. Aye, aye. It's but a deem's crawl. What's this? As he was studying it out, Starbuck took a long cutting spade pole and with his knife slightly split the end to insert the letter there and in that way hand it to the boat without its coming any closer to the ship. Meantime, Ahab holding the letter muttered, Mr. Har... Yes, Mr. Harry, a woman's penny hand, the man's wife, I'll wager. Aye, Mr. Harry Macy, ship Jeroboam. Why, it's Macy, and he's dead. Poor fellow, poor fellow, and from his wife, sighed Mayhew. But let me have it. Nay, keep it thyself cried Gabriel to Ahab. Thou art soon going that way. Curses throttle thee, yelled Ahab. Captain Mayhew, stand by now to receive it. And taking the fatal missive from Starbuck's hands, he caught it in the slit of the pole and reached it over towards the boat. But as he did so, the oarsmen expectantly desisted from rowing. The boat drifted a little towards the ship's stern so that, as if by magic, the letter suddenly ranged along with Gabriel's eager hand. He clutched it in an instant, seized the boat knife and, impaling the letter on it, sent it thus loaded back into the ship. It fell at Ahab's feet. Then Gabriel shrieked out to his comrades, to give way with their oars, and in that manner the mutinous, mutinous boat rapidly shot away from the Picard. As, after the interlude, the seamen resumed their work upon the jacket of the whale, many strange things were hinted in reference to this wild affair. The Monkey Rope In the tumultuous business of cutting in and attending to a whale, there is much running backwards and forwards among the crew. Now hands are wanted here, and then again hands are wanted there. There is no saying, staying in any one place, for at one and the same time everything has to be done everywhere. It is much the same with him who endeavors the description of the scene. We must now retrace our way a little. It was mentioned that, upon first breaking ground in the whale's back, the blubber hook was inserted into the original hole there cut by the spades of the mates. But how did so clumsy? But how did so clumsy and weighty a mass as that same hook get fixed in that, in that hole? It was inserted there by my particular friend, Quickwig, whose duty it was as harpooner to descend upon the monster's back for the special purpose referred to. But in very many cases, circumstances require that the harpooner shall remain on the whale till the whole flensing or stripping operation is concluded. The whale, be it observed, lies almost entirely submerged, excepting the immediate parts operated upon. So, down there, some ten feet below the level of the deck, the poor harpooner flounders about, half on the whale and half in the water, as the vast mass revolves like a treadmill beneath him. On the occasion in question, Quickwake figured in the Highland costume, a shirt and socks, in which to my eyes at least he appeared to uncommon advantage, and no one had a better chance to observe him, as will presently be seen. 
being the savage's bowsman, that is, the person who pulled the bow oar in his boat, the second one from forward, it was my cheerful duty to attend upon him while taking that hard scrabble scramble upon the dead whale's back. You have seen Italian organ boys holding a dancing ape by a long cord. Just so, from the ship's steep side, did I hold quick quicks down there in the sea, by what is technically called in the fishery a monkey rope, attached to a strong strip of canvas, belted around the waist. It was a humorously perilous business for both of us, for before we proceeded further it must be said that the monkey rope was fast at both ends, fast to Quick Quick's broad canvas belt and fast to my narrow leather one. So that for better or for worse, we two, for the time, were wedded and should Poor quick-quigs sink to rise no more than both usage and honor demanded that, instead of cutting the cord, it should drag me down in his wake. So then, an elongated Siamese ligature united us. Quick-quig was my own inseparable twin brother. Nor could I any way get rid of the dangerous liabilities which the hempen, hempen bond entailed oh hempen bond right of course so strongly and metaphysically did i conceive of my situation then that while earnestly watching his motions i seemed distinctly to perceive that my own individuality was now merged in a joint stock company of two that my free will had received a mortal wound and that another's mistake or misfortune might plunge innocent me into unmerited disaster and death. Therefore, I saw that here was a sort of interregnum of providence, for its even-handed equity never could have sanctioned so gross an injustice. And yet, still further pondering while I jerked him now, and then from between the whale and the ship, which would threaten to jam him still further pondering, I say, I saw that this situation of mine was the precise situation of every mortal that breeds. Only, in most cases, he, one way or other, has this Siamese connection with a plu plurality, I can never properly pronounce this word, has this Siamese connection with a plurality of other mortals. If your banker breaks, you snap. If your apothecary by mistake sends you poison in your pills, you die. True, you may say that by exceeding caution, you may possibly escape these and the multitudinous other evil chances of life but handle Quick Quig's monkey rope heedfully as I would, sometimes he jerked it so that I came very near sliding overboard. Nor could I possibly forget that. Do what I would, I only had the management of one end of it. All right, so footnote. The monkey rope is found in all whalers, but it was only in the Pico that the monkey and his holder were ever tied together. This improvement upon the original usage was introduced by no less a man than Stubb, in order to afford to the imperiled harpooner the strongest guarantee for the faithfulness and vigilance of his monkey rope holder. I've not read any footnotes that were uh, in the previous pages, and I'm really sorry about that. I should have. I don't know why I did not include that. It's part of the story. Maybe, maybe it felt uh, to me like a break from the story. I don't know. But at this moment, I do feel that I should have included all of those. I'm really sorry. Anyways, I can't make up for that anymore. So let, let's just let it go. I have hinted that I would often jerk poor Quick Quig from between the whale and the ship, where he would occasionally fall from the incessant rolling and swaying of both. But this was not the only jamming jeopardy 
he was exposed to. Unappalled by the massacre made upon them during the night, the sharks now freshly and more keenly allured by the before pent blood which began to flow from the carcass. The rabid creatures swarmed round it like bees in a beehive. And right in among those sharks was Quig, who often pushed them aside with his floundering feet, a thing altogether incredible were it not that attracted by such prey as a dead whale, the otherwise miscellaneously carnivorous shark will sendo, seldom touch a man. Nevertheless, it may well be believed that since they have such a ravenous finger in the pie, it is deemed but wise to look sharp to them. Accord accordingly, besides the monkey rope, which, uh, with which I now and then jerked the poor fellow. God damn, this sounds so wrong. Every time he says, I jerked the poor fellow, I jerked quick, quick. It's which I now and then jerked the poor fellow from too close a vicinity to the maw of what seemed a peculiarly ferocious shark. He was provided with still another protection. Suspended over the side in one of the stages, Tashtego and Dago continually flourished over his head a couple of keen spa whale spades, wherewith they slaughtered as many sharks as they could reach. This procedure of theirs, to be sure, was very disinterested and benevolent of them. They meant Quickwig's best happiness, I admit, but in their hasty zeal to befriend him and from the circumstance that both he and the sharks were at times half hidden by the bl blood mudded water, those indiscreet spades of theirs would come nearer, amputating a leg than a tail. But poor Quickwig, I suppose, straining and gasping there with that great iron hook, poor Quickwig, I suppose only prayed to his yojo and gave up his life into the hands of his gods. Well, well, my dear comrade and twin brother, thought I, as I drew in and then slacked off the rope to every swell of the sea. What matters it, after all? Are you not the precious image of each and all of us men in this wailing world? What unsounded ocean you gasp in is life. Those sharks, your foes, those spades, your friends, and what between sharks and spades you are in a sad pickle and peril. Poor lad. But courage. There is good cheer in store for you, Quickwig. For now, as with blue lips and bloodshot eyes, the exhausted savage at last climbs up the chains and stands all dripping and involuntarily trembling over the side. The steward advances and, with a benevolent, consolatory glance, hands him what? Some hot cognac? No, hands him, ye gods, hands him a cup of tepid ginger and water. Ginger? Do I smell ginger? Suspiciously asked Tub, coming near. Yes, this must be ginger. Peering into as yet untasted, peering into the as yet untasted cup. Then standing as if incredulous for a while, he calmly walked towards the astonished steward, slowly saying, Ginger? Ginger, and will you have the goodness to tell me, Mr. Doughboy, where lies the virtue of ginger? Ginger, is ginger the sort of fuel you use, Doughboy, to kindle a fire in the shivering cannibal? Ginger, what the devil is ginger? Sea coal, firewood, lucifer matches, tinder, gunpowder? What the devil is ginger? I say that you offer this cup to our poor quickwig here? There is some sneaking temperance society movement about this business, he suddenly added, 
now approaching Starbuck, who had just come from forward. Will you look at that canakin, sir? Smell of it, if you please. Then watching the mate's countenance, he added, oh, then watching the mate's countenance, he added, the steward, Mr. Starbuck, had the face to offer that calomel and jalap to Quickwig there. This instant of the whale, is the steward an apothecary, sir? And may I ask whether this is the sort of bitters by which he blows back in the life into a half-drowned man? I trust not, said Starbuck. It is poor stuff enough. Aye, aye, steward, cried Stubb. We'll teach you to drag a harp near, not if your apothecary is me medicine here. You want to poison us, do ye? You have got our insurances on our lives and want to murder us all and pocket the proceeds, do ye? It was not me, cried Doughboy. It was Aunt Charity that brought the ginger on board and bade me never give the harponeers any spirits. But only his ginger job, only this, only this ginger job, so she called it. Ginger job, you gingerly rascal, take that and run along with ye to the lockers and get something better. I hope I do no wrong, Mr. Starbuck. It is the captain's orders, grog for the harpoonier on a whale. Enough, replied Starbuck. Only don't hit him again. But, oh, I never hurt when I hit, except when I hit a whale or something of that sort. And this fellow's a weasel. What were you about saying, sir? Only this. Go down with him and get what thou wantest thyself. When Stubb reappeared, he came with the dark flask in one hand and a sort of tea caddy in the other. The first contained strong spirits and was handed to Quickwig. The second was Uncharity's gift, and that was freely given to the waves. A really nice chapter, that. Anyways, it's logged on again, and... I'm back, reading the lockdown away. Thank you for listening in. And I'm really, I'm again, really sorry for taking that long a break. I really, really hope to continue this forever, as long as I live. But who knows? Who really, really does know? Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this. And I enjoyed reading after so long, so very much. Like reading aloud is an experience on its own. Just absolutely loved it. That's all. Hadebra. Hadebra, 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 everyone. Hadebra, Hadebra.